Just by way of reminder, we are continuing our discipleship course and focusing uh, during this section upon the disciples' mission. And we are discovering the fact that uh, the disciples' mission, while it may uh, find many different uh, ways of uh, expressing it, is uh, ultimately speaking to glorify the Father. So that whatever we do, whether that be in attitude, word, thought, or deed, uh, ought to be uh, being played out in our lives for the glory of God. Ultimately speaking, the fruitfulness that we are, uh, or the fruit that we are bearing, is meant to bring glory to the Father, who is, uh, through Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. He is the initiator and he is the worker uh, within us, so that although we do the things that he gives us to do, uh, for which he also grants us uh, rewards, eternal rewards, he ultimately speaking, is the enabler, and therefore he receives the glory. And it's uh, important for us to take that uh, that place of, of humility before the Father, where even when people uh, congratulate us or recognize that we have done a good work, work we should be quick to uh, acknowledge uh, the, the presence of the Father. We should be quick to acknowledge the fact that these things are, are due not to our own uh, ingenuity or, or ability, but that they are attributed to, uh, as we've learned, the Spirit of the living God. For it's not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. We've been focusing on, in this section, about on uh, uh, John chapter 15 and talking about the vine, the husbandman, and the branches. And uh, we uh, considered each of the different uh, actors, if you will, if you permit me to, to use that phrase, in this particular parable that Jesus is talking about. Of course, we talked about Jesus as being the vine, the life giver, the source. We talked about the branches, that's us who bear the fruit. And we spoke specifically about our need to remain attached to the vine, how that there is uh, a, a, a double... Uh, activity. Both the Father, uh, the Lord, holds on to us. They hold us. They, they preserve us. But we also have the responsibility as our part in the, in the covenant relationship that we have uh, to hold on, to continue, to persevere, to remain attached as the parable uh, uses the, the, this type of terminology uh, specifically, as, as we have seen in the King James, to abide in Christ. Well, we've looked at all of those things, and we've come to our, our fourth lesson, and I've, I've saved this one uh, for last. Um, took it a little bit out of, out of order, but uh, I want to, to take this um, last because in, for many people, this is the most difficult aspect of the parable, the work of the gardener, or the husbandman, as the King James says, which, of course, is uh, the work of the Father in our life. So, how, how does the gardener care for the vine? This is what we're going to consider. How does the husbandman care for the, vi or for the, uh, for the vine, in particular, for the branches? We see from Jesus' teaching that the gardener does two basic things in his care of the vine or the branches. On the one hand, the gardener removes the dead branches that do not produce fruit. And this is a very important aspect for us to grasp. And we find it in, in verse 2 where he says, And every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he, the husbandman, taketh it away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it. So we can see here that the Father uh, removes the fruitless uh, branches from the vine. Now he doesn't do this because he's cruel or hard, but he does it to ensure the fruitfulness of the whole vine. Because each and every one of us knows that dead branches drain the life of all who are connected to it. And it's, it's important for us to recognize this fact as I said, it's not that he's cruel or hard because the Lord um, in, in other parables demonstrates his great patience 
with the branches. He demonstrates his great patience with the tree in, in, a, in a parable that, uh, that the Lord gave. He also talked about a particular um, uh, owner of a, of, a, of a plot of ground who had planted a tree. He left it for one year. It produced nothing. He left it for two years. It produced nothing. He called his worker and said, let's remove it because it's not producing anything. And the worker said to him, no, let's wait one more year. Let's, let's dig around the tree and, and, and fertilize it and, and show a little more patience and see what, uh, what it will bring forth. And, and that's the same that we see here in the work of the Father. He's not out to cut us off by any means. His desire is that we remain attached, that we that we live and produce the fruit. But there comes a time when uh, the Father will uh, remove that which impedes the growth uh, of the whole vine. Now, the Father's preferred method, of course, is to prune the branches so that they might bring forth more and more fruit. And that's a thing that we have to really get into our hearts. We're not here just to, to bear fruit for one year. We're here to bear fruit, that our fruit would remain, and that our fruit would grow, that there would be a, a better and continual harvest of fruit in our lives. We should be producing better and better fruit as we become more and more like Jesus. And this is what the Lord is doing. He's, he's pruning, the Father is doing, He's pruning the things from our lives that hinder us from, uh, from uh, uh, being more like Jesus. So we take comfort in the fact that the gardener cuts off every dead branch and he prunes every branch in the vine that does bear fruit. So this is something that is uh, positive. And, and in it, we can see, uh, as we, we mentioned yesterday in, in uh, Romans uh, chapter 11, where we were talking about the branches and the wild olive branches and the, the natural branches, we, we saw just a, a tinge of uh, the, the goodness and the severity of God in action. And we have to maintain uh, this throughout because anything different from that is nothing more than an idol. There are some people who want to focus only on God's severity and condemn everybody. And then there are some people who want to focus only on God's mercy and, and open things up to some sort of a universalism, uh, which which is, of course, the other, spectrum, the other uh, uh, side of the spectrum. Uh, both are wrong. We have to behold both the severity and the goodness of God and maintain those because God is, is good huh, to those who believe, but to those who are unbelieving and who harden their heart, he will demonstrate his severity by cutting off. Now, to understand the gardener's method, we're going to take a close look at uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse verses 11 and 13, through 13. Uh, where the author describes the father's way of correcting his sons and his daughters. Now, we've looked at this uh, previously in, in different, uh, in different, uh, for different purposes, uh, but we have not f focused on the section that we're going to look at today. We, we focused more on verses 1 and 2, uh, where we were recognizing predominantly the fact that Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith, and and the fact that he was also uh, corrected, uh, or corrected, uh, uh, brought that there was a process of bringing about a perfect obedience through his sufferings. That that's really the thing because Jesus was sinless, of course, and uh, so it's not the sense of correction in the same in the same manner that we needed. It. It's it was the testing and the trials of the sufferings that he endured. Okay, so ours is a little bit different. We do make mistakes, and we do need to be corrected. Uh, so we just make a correction on that. Okay, so let's take a look then at Hebrews chapter 12, and we're going to look specifically at verses 11 through, uh, I'm sorry, verses 3 through 11. It reads, For consider him, Jesus, that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. You have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin, like Jesus did, for example, in the Garden of Gethsemane. We saw that. Verse 5. 
and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord. In other words, don't treat it lightly. For nor faint when you are rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and he scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if he be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then you are uh, illegitimate bastards, it uses in, in the King James, but it, it means illegitimate, and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh, flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily, truly, for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. But he, for our, our profit, that we meet, might be partakers of his holiness. No chastening for the present seems to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth peaceable fruit, the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised there by. So we see here immediately that we have an aversion to God's correction. There is things, you know, um, disappointments with ourselves, uh, uh, self-flagellation, you know, uh, like they say in, in Spanish, culpa mia, culpa mia, you know, you, it's, it's, a, it's the uh, idea of those uh, in, in many different Latin countries, uh, in the Philippines, for example, well, they will take a cat and nine tails and, and whip themselves, you know, for the, for the sins that they have committed. It's, it's, a, it's a really a, a, another gospel um, because the fact of the matter is Jesus took our stripes so that we wouldn't have to. Matter of fact, us taking our stripes means absolutely nothing. Um, because what can we give, you know, as the Lord taught us, in exchange for our souls? Anyway, don't become discouraged when God corrects you. This is this is the, the message of verse 3. Consider him that endures the contradiction of sinners, lest you be wearied and faint in your mind. Oh, not again. I mean, I can hear some of you just, just saying, oh, not again. How, you know, how many times am I going to mess up in the same area? Well, you're going to mess up a lot in the same areas. But what you're going to discover is that God's mercy and God's grace are, are broad and wide and sufficient for you if you will maintain a true heart before him you know you know we fall into sins and we fall into temptations quite often but the lord is looking for those who will continue to look to him even though we have failed and continuing to to expect that his mercies will be renewed every morning so let's not be discouraged when the lord uh, does bring uh, correction why? He said, for you have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Now, Jesus did, but we haven't. Have any of us really known that type of intensity in our striving against sin? I mean, we have to ask ourselves, you know, honestly. Uh, a lot of us are bowled over uh, because we make no effort. <laughs> and the Lord, maybe that's an area where the Lord needs to bring some correction in, into our lives, that we need to resist you know, and 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 that's an absolute necessity. Uh, James, in 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 his uh, uh, epistle to the church, taught resist the devil and he will flee from you. Submit to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. So we have to to learn that, but not to be uh, discouraged. And this is the point: uh, we cannot forget. God's exhortation. This is what we see. You have forgotten the exhortation which God speaketh unto you as unto children. And this is this is that exhortation. My son, despise not or do not lightly esteem. In other words, recognize, if we put it in a positive sense, recognize the value of God's correction in our lives. It is not that the Lord is angry with us. In verse 6, we see, For whom the Lord loveth, he chastens. Whom the Lord loveth, he 
chastens and he and he and he scourges every son whom he receives so we see you know that we're in good company he he corrected moses he corrected david he corrected uh abraham jacob isaac he corrected the apostle paul he corrected peter severely at times he corrected john he corrected james he corrected each and every one that he receives as a son so we're in good company we ought not to be faint-hearted uh, uh, and, and we ought not to think lightly of or despise the chastening of the lord uh, because the lord um, does this chastening for a particular person it's not to put us down it's not to make us feel bad you know i think sometimes maybe uh, our our parents when we were younger out of their frustration corrected us um, with not such uh, uh, high aims as as our father has who is correcting us of course with uh, with perfection so god treats us as sons as long as we willingly submit ourselves to his correction only illegitimate children refuse correction and this is what we see in uh, uh, verse uh, verse 8 if you are without chastisement whereof all are partakers then are you illegitimate and you're not sons you see the son um, that, that that spirit of the son that has been sent into our hearts crying abba father is also willing to submit to the father why because he recognizes the great love of the father and the fact that the father most certainly has a a purpose and a plan in the correction that he brings to our lives so there's no reason for us to lose heart there's no reason for us to esteem lightly we need to uh, uh, value and appreciate the fact that God is taking the time to show us the right way to bring correction to our lives and when necessary to scourge or to bring or allow or permit or engineer circumstances however you want to say it um, through the sufferings you know sometimes that we go through sometimes you know we fall into sufferings uh, not just because of, of of the fact that we're living in a in a world uh, where it's it's commonplace, but because God has engineered circumstances and situations to bring us into a place of chastisement, and there are many different examples that we can see uh, in 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 the Word of God, and uh, we can't of course attribute it to to our, our difficult situations to that at all times. Sometimes there is the correction, sometimes there is the testing, and sometimes there is you know the 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 work of the enemy that comes against us, and it calls for discernment to understand what time we're in, what place we're in. Uh, what is the opportunity that's before us? So, having said all that, uh, God's purpose, you know, as we have already seen in John 15, is that we would live and be partakers of His holiness. And this is what we see uh, in verse in verse 10. For they verily, and He was talking about uh, the fact that uh, our natural parents do also uh, correct us and we accept that chastisement uh, you know all things being equal in, in in other words that that our parents did have a good intention in doing it and I know and acknowledge that there are parents who are not good parents uh, who are downright evil uh, and and who um, abuse their authority and, and abuse children we're not talking about that we're talking about parents who love their children um, and correct and chastise and even punish because they have the child's good interest at 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 heart and so uh we see here that they they chastise us for a few days it says after their own pleasure but he does it for our profit you see in verse 10 he the lord the father is is chastising us for our own profit and for what purpose that we might be partakers of his holy of his holiness in other words that we might be partakers of his nature in other words that we might become like Christ in other words that the sun might shine through us i don't have any other words <laughs> that should be sufficient to demonstrate the fact that the father is seeking to produce this holiness which is the essence of his of his being in us so of course he's going to have to bring correction to a fallen people, a fallen race, who have been regenerated in Christ, of course. Now, 
nobody ever said that correction was going to be easy. Correction from God is uncomfortable, and it, and it often offends our pride. Often it's like a sword entering into to your heart. Um, you feel that pang on the inside of you. You, you. For example, when Peter declared that he would never deny the Lord, and, and uh, because the Lord had told him that he would uh, uh, deny him three times, and he denied that. <laughs> but we see that in reality, the time came, and he did actually deny the Lord three times. And at that point, when, that, when the uh, rooster uh, crowed, immediately Peter, um, Peter remembered what Jesus had said to him. And, and, and it was like a knife entering into his heart, you know, a double, double-edged double blade just piercing his soul. And it's the same way with us often. Uh, we feel uh, many different things uh, when that correction comes, whether it be through preaching, through reading, through the Spirit speaking to our hearts, etc., etc., whatever the, me- the, the, the means, uh, the Father is ultimately behind it. But that, that initial uh, jab, that pricking of the heart, uh, sometimes brings discouragement. And this passage is telling us, do not be discouraged. No chastening is, for the present, it says, is a cause for joy. <laughs> that's, a, that's a wonderful way to put it. There, it. It's not a cause for joy. We don't, you know, you be, you know, shout and run and, and kick. I've just been corrected. No, there's a sense, you know, of, of shame. There's a sense of, uh, of failure uh, that often accompanies these things. But ultimately, we have to raise our head and look to the Father and all of His mercy and, and express our thankfulness for caring for us. So he says, no chastening at the present seems to be joyous, but grievous, grievous. That's what it feels like on the inside. Nevertheless, afterward, after that pang, that initial confrontation, afterward, it, you, it's kind of like when your boss brings you in, you know. Whenever you get called to the boss's office, if it's not a, uh, a common day thing, there's always kind of a uh-oh, an uh-oh. What did I do? And your heart kind of falls, you know. You're, you know, you may even shake a little from the adrenaline that rushes through your body. Uh, the same kind of thing occurs when there's confrontation uh, by the Lord in our lives. Nevertheless, afterward, after that pang, after that confrontation, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. In other words, that correction brings forth a more righteous life, a life more in line with his heart, more in line with his holiness. And that's what we're looking for, to be more in line with Jesus. So it brings forth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto who? Unto them that are exercised thereby. So we hear what the Lord has to say, even though it it splits our heart, and we accept it, we humble ourselves before the Father, and and we, we, with time, put into practice the things that he shows us at that initial moment, and it will bring forth fruit unto righteousness as we exercise ourselves. So the call of discipleship, the mission of the disciple, ultimately speaking, is to glorify the Father. As we have said several times throughout this section, we have particular things that we do And those things, when we do it in the right spirit, for the right motives, right time, right place, with the right people, when we get those things lined up, uh, then the Father is glorified. But uh, ultimately speaking, we glorify the Father when we bear much fruit. When we do that, we do things for the right reason. We do things in the right spirit, not for vainglory, but for the glory of the Father.